Hello everyone, uh, time for another Baltic talk. And uh, uh, heading on today's talk is what's the deal with eel? So when you talk about eel or anything around, surrounding eel, you have to start with its rather amazing life history. And uh, I just, uh, to, to try and uh, illustrate this, I'm just uh, standing in front of a world map. And um, um, first I'd just like to say that uh, regarding eel, there's a lot of things we don't know. So a lot of things we assume or a lot of things we think we know a little bit about or we have clues but we don't actually know. And that's actually part of the reason why it's the coolest fish around. But like I said, to start to talking about eel, you have to start with its life history or its life cycle. And you know, this is, I hope you can see, but this is obviously Europe and North America, South America, and this is the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, we have eels here in our region. They live with us, among us, they have always done that as far as we can remember and have actually human records we know of eel. Eel is likely a species that go all the way back to dinosaur uh, ages um, when the world looked very different. <clears throat> and that is potentially one of the reasons why it has such a crazy life cycle. But anyway, we know that eel lives right here in, in our waters and in the Mediterranean and the North African country. This is its sort of habitat when it's growing and becoming a, a but it actually comes from something or somewhere completely different. The eels uh, are born in the area that we call the Sargasso Sea area. So basically they are habitants of uh, Bermuda or south of Bermuda. That's where they come from. Uh, <clears throat> we don't exactly know where. It's a rather vast area. The circle I'm doing now is pretty much entire Central Europe. So we don't know exactly where. But we know they go into this region and spawn. So eels are born out here at sea, but they come to our shores and our rivers and lakes to live in freshwater. So they are the, sort of the opposite of a salmon or a sea trout. They, they are born in the sea, but live in freshwater. Sometimes they stay on the coast and they live on the coast. But anyway, this rather epic journey of several thousand kilometers here, they do actually twice in their life. So they're born here, they, they migrate or actually follow the current, reaching our shores after maybe two years at sea. Uh, this drift or this, this migration when they're very small probably takes a year, something like that. Um, uh, and then they live in our waters and our coasts and on the rivers for up to 30 or even as long as 100 years, but the normal lifespan of an eel is not 100 years, but they can live to be very old. Another crazy thing about eels. Um, <clears throat> so the reason for this is extreme life cycle, it's actually the longest migration of any fish we know, uh, is we don't know, like I said, we don't know. Uh, one potential explanation is, like I said, the eels have been around so long that the earth actually looked different when they evolved as an eel. So, the, the continents were much, much closer, so the distance to swim out to sea to spawn was not as great as today. That is potentially one explanation, but we don't really know. So, regarding eel, there are a lot of things we don't know. We don't know exactly where they go. We don't know actually why or how they find their way there. We don't know why they swim uh, or follow the currents. Yes, that's fine. We don't know when they land here, how they move, why they go upstream and some stay on the coast. We don't know why. We don't know what turns them into male or female, really, because when they come, they are, they are, uh, they, they are not, they are neither. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we don't understand exactly what triggers their migration and when they sort of consider themselves being mature and swim back to the Sargasso Sea. So there's so many things we don't know about. Uh, and yet we've been living close to them and next to them for millions of years, likely, and we eat them and we're fishing them and we, we have a, a culture in many, many areas around uh, Europe which holds eel as a, an intricate part of their culture, including, of course, our own Baltic region, uh, where eel is uh, uh, an important uh, fish. So, the eel is enigmatic and strange and fantastic all at once and one of the main problems with eel and eel management is the fact that we don't know. There are so many things we don't know about them. Uh, and yet, uh, the eel is in, in trouble. It's actually, the situation for eel is rather severe. 
And we're basically about to lose this fish, even though we don't know enough or we don't know about the eel, it may actually disappear. So today I'm just going to talk about, like I just did, about the eel and also the state of the eel stock, which is, you know, so what's the deal with eel? Why, why are we engaged or why is the eel in trouble? And how can we show uh, or what do we know about the eel uh, population? So I'm going to move the camera now over here. Is that okay? Good. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a little graph to illustrate what has happened to the eel population. And again, it's important to underline here that in the, in the case of our eel, the European eel, there's only one stock. There's one population, like I just showed you in this entire uh, geographical area of Europe and Northern Africa. There's one population. So it's indeed a, a, a globe trotter or a, a full EU member, basically. It doesn't separate between... Uh, uh, you know, uh, northern stock or southern stock or whatnot. It's it's one stock. Uh, this is what we have uh, regarding facts of the eel population, the European eel. So this is a graph trying to illustrate uh, the incoming juvenile eels. Now the eels I showed you that come from the Sargasso Sea as very very small eels, tiny small things like this, a few centimeters. And they move basically with the currents and they swim and they reach our shore. So we have historic data. We have uh, uh, landings and, and, uh, and checkpoints on, on the amount of what's called glass eel. So that's the juvenile eel. So uh, it's important, it, it's a, it's a, to some people it's rather strange when we talk about the eel as critically endangered, but I'll return to it in a minute, because there are still thousands and thousands of eels. So the fishermen are out there fishing, uh, we can see them, we can, you know, uh, locate them for, for scientific purposes and whatnot. It's not like, it's not, it's not a panda. And this is important to understand that we're not trying to compare, or we cannot compare uh, endangered species to another endangered species. But this graph basically shows the reason why it's critically endangered. Because, as you can see here, somewhere around, uh, or pre predating 1960 to about 1980, we have the situation of glass seal uh, uh, fluctuating rather, you know, uh, greatly, I guess, but still in rather high numbers. But after some time after the 1980s, we saw a sharp decline in, in the incoming juveniles, meaning the result of the spawning. We've seen a, a dramatic drop of this, and it's been extremely low, basically, since the late 90s, which this is trying to just to illustrate. And in fact, based on the historical records from 1960 to 1979, we've made an, or the scientists have made an index, and if this is the index 100, this is the, the, the sort of baseline level that we're comparing against, we have seen the past 10 years uh, a situation where we're down to basically one and a half, roughly one and a half percent on average uh, of incoming glass yield every year. So this is extremely low compared to the period, the reference period, of course. Now, some might argue this is quite long ago. We have many fish stocks that have changed over time, and you know it's rather dramatic changes for many fish stocks, but it's special regarding yield. Like I said before, the yield become very, very old. So if you consider the eels that came somewhere in the early or the 90s, their parents potentially were born here somewhere in the 70s or even the 60s when we have this situation. So the, the, this dramatic decline and the fact that eels become so old is the reason why we now consider them being critically endangered. It is not because there's just five, ten, a thousand left, because there are plenty more than that. But it's because this dramatic, uh, obviously, um, uh, impaired recruitment that we must consider this as, as, a, as a critically endangered species. Because even, um, you know, considering the amount of eels we have here compared to here, adult eels, and the, re the returning uh, sort of glass eels effect of those eels, we clearly see that this timeline, if nothing is done, will just simply continue going down to zero. Because we simply won't have a critical mass of adult eels to find each other out of that massive Sargasso Sea area just spawned. 
So this is the reason, not that it's just 10 or 15 left. This is the reason. So what have we, humans, what have we done in response to this? Okay, so um, the ICES, the scientist, scientific group that uh, gives uh, or produces advice on, on fish stocks and, and fishing uh, each year uh, to the European Union, they have since long reacted, of course. They've seen this, this decline and already, uh, already in uh, 2003, they issued uh, a scientific advice stating, which they had then basically repeated, uh, they stated that all human mortality should be as close to zero as possible. That, that's basically what they did already here. So they, they noted that already here. After this decline, they saw that. So they sounded the alarms. They, they started actually earlier, but here they started using the phrase that what they're using today. So that all human mortality should be as close to zero as possible. So they have repeated that since 2003. Um, what else then has happened? So that was the scientific advice. That was the alarm bells. Okay, yes, we, there are other things that, uh, that we have done. So in um, 2007, the EU reacted and established an EU recovery plan. Uh, that was the first step, also something the scientists called for already in the early 2000s. So that's an EU recovery plan. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. 2008, that's when we got the uh, um, uh, uh, red listing or, or the listing of eel as a critically endangered species. That's the first time it was notified as, as uh, being critically endangered due to this decline. So that was an important milestone as well. And then we have in 2010, I don't know if you can see these numbers, I hope we can. 2010, we have another EU uh, regulation, the CITES, which controls uh, now, since 2010, uh, the EU export and imports within or out or in or out to EU. So that banned all EU export and import uh, in the EU. So these are uh, crucial milestones when it comes to management efforts from, from our side to react to this decline and the scientific advice given. So uh, the EU plan, like I said, the EU plan tried to establish some kind of target goal to reach. Uh, and this was the first of its kind uh, to do that for eel. And like I said, we, there are so many things we don't know about eel. We have indices we have evidence showing that there is a decline but like i said we don't actually know why exactly for you know all the detailed reasons is it only about fisheries is it hydropower dams is it uh, pollutants or 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 what is it likely it's it's all of the above but uh, we'll come back to that in another episode later on what's actually impacting the deal today but this plan established a goal of trying to uh, get back to a situation where 40% of the glass eel compared to the sort of pristine uh, conditions, again, what is pristine, we don't really know, but to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to increase the escapement of silver eel, to basically incre increase the amount of spawning eels that can go to Sargasso and, you know, turn this curve around, basically. So that was the intention. The, the, it, it remains to be seen whether that intention and ambition is high enough. Uh, I don't consider it being high enough, considering that we, all the measures that have been put in place or has not been put in place has really not uh, resulted in any reaction to this, this, this line, this uh, decline. We've seen small, small variations, but like I said, on average, it's really low. Uh, that's disheartening for sure, but uh, there are still more things to be done. So the EU plan set up some goals for the member states to establish national EU recovery plans uh, and supported by these other two uh, uh, important milestones indicating the, the, the terrible stock, the state of this yield stock. So, um, yes, so next time we're going to come back to what we need to do, what we can do here and now, uh, the major impacts that we can influence here and now and actually only now in two weeks time the minister will meet in the fishery council and they will discuss the EU and what to do just the coming year. So there's short, medium and long term efforts that needs to be done for you and we'll return to that next time. So thanks for watching as usual, post any questions, ask anything about EU uh, to us here directly on Facebook or email or in any other way. Okay.
Thanks, guys.